Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this symposium marking the centenary of Joan Erdley. A hundred years ago today, May the 18th, 1921, Joan Kathleen Harding Erdley was born on a dairy farm in Sussex. Uh, war and her mother's family connections brought her to Scotland in 1939, and the place and its people, especially its children, inspired her for her short but prolific life. This celebration is one of many happening across the year. It's a collaboration between the Hunterian Museum and the Scottish Women in the Arts Research Network, SWORN. It was set up in 2018 to encourage and promote research in the work of historic women artists, and in particular artists whose work may be isolated and spread across many different collections. Joan Erdley is their first major project and obviously fits the bill perfectly. And we'll hear from curators about many different aspects of Joan's work today. From the ones that you may know, like the seascapes of Catiline or the children of Townhead, to lesser known works like the beautiful animal designs on the playpen, which Paisley Museum have in their collection. Let me introduce you to some of the speakers that you'll be able to see on screen at the moment. Dr Victoria Irvin of Paisley Museum and Dr Katrina Makara of St Andrews University. They'll be talking about that playpen and the idea of play in Joan Erdley's work. Anne Dulo, who's Curator of Art at the Hunterian, she will be talking about their upcoming exhibition and its substantial Erdley collection, which is uh, going to be well seen, I think, from July to September this year. Dr Jo Meacock from Glasgow Museums will be looking at two specific works in their collection, both from 1962 at the very end of Joan Erdley's career, including Two Children, which was the very last painting and was actually on her easel in Townhead when she died. Lila Risco from the National Galleries of Scotland will be in conversation with Matilda Mitchell, whose late husband Douglas Hall was the first keeper of the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art and who herself has been involved in cataloguing Scottish art, especially that of Joan Erdley. Um, I believe that Matilda has catalogued many of the works that you'll find across the country in, in a collection. So we should hear some more about that. Our sole man on the panel, uh, at least in terms of our speakers, is Nick Cardinal of Lion and Turnbull Auctioneers, who'll tell us about Joan Erdley at auction. Nick has been involved in selling Erdley's for four, close to 40 years, I think, certainly four decades. Uh, and uh, and has seen the prices steadily rise. So he'll be able to tell us a bit about that. And Jan Patience is an arts journalist and editor. She's the Herald's arts writer, among many other things, with a passion for all art, especially Erdley. And if you haven't read her biography of Joan on the Joan Erdley 100 website, please do. It's a wonderfully vivid account of Joan's life. We'll also hear from Ruth Impey about the Aran Art Heritage Trail. Uh, and we'll also hear from Anne Morrison Hudson, Joan Erdley's niece and an artist in her own right. Anne's made a series of very personal ceramic works which relate to her family and Joan's going back several uh, generations and uh, also inspired by Joan and by Catiline. So we'll hear a lot more about that. And we hope to have plenty of time for questions 
at the end. So um, feel free to fire some questions in for us or while our speakers are telling you about the various episodes that we're talking about. Uh, but first up, I'd like to introduce the director of The Hunterian, Steph Shelton. Thank you very much, Pauline, um, for that. Um, thank you very much also for um, willing to chair this session um, for us today. Um, and welcome, of course, to all of you um, who are watching this um, in what is very likely our most popular event to date online. Um, you're hearing great numbers, that's uh, excellent. And it goes to testify to the popularity of John Eardley. And as you may um, understand from my name and my accent that I'm not Scottish born, um, I'm Dutch, um, and I'd not heard um, about jo John Eardley before I came to Scotland um, about four years ago, but it's been for me one of the revelations. Um, um, I'm particularly partial to her more abstract Catalan work, uh, the seascapes, uh, I think that are uh, particularly uh, beautiful and great works of uh, abstract painting. Um, but that's a personal opinion, and you're all allowed to like exactly which works um, um, by early um, that are your that have your preference. Um, we will show definitely later in the year at the Hunterian. We will show um, a small selection from our um, um, earlys um, in our collections, um, and they will be up in the Hunterian Art Gallery for um, a number of months as one of the many um, displays um, that will see John Eardley's work showcased across Scotland in um, this period and the month to come. Um, I think I need to express a special uh, word of thanks to um, uh, two people. Um, I think Jan Patience uh, can be regarded as one of the driving forces, or so if not the driving force, be behind this whole exercise. I remember really, really well when she invited um, myself and Andrew Lowe to Anne Morrison Hudson's house in the neighborhood of Glasgow um, um, to talk about uh, this centenary and the potential to do uh, a big project around um, Eardley's uh, uh, centenary. Um, and here we are. Um, I think um, um, it is also the generosity of Anne Morrison Hudson to be with, to, to willing to share um, um, her personal experience as a family member, as a niece of Joan Eardley. Um, and I think, uh, um, and it, she was already mentioned by Pauline, um, she sworn the Scottish Women in the Arts um, um, Network, I think is a great initiative and hopefully um, um, this first initiative around um, John Eardley is definitely not the first and, and, and the last that will ask attention for the immense contributions that women have made um, as artists, uh, as art historians, as curators uh, in the arts in Scotland. Um, you saw briefly on the screen, screen uh, the website, um, um, but go to Sworn and you'll find them uh, uh, online. So that's enough for me. Um, um, I hope you have a great afternoon. Um, I'm sure it's going to be massively interesting and I'm going to give you back to Pauline um, to take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. So um, this is just one of many events to mark Joan Erdley's centenary, obviously. The fact that it's today on the actual uh, date of her birthday makes it extra special. But there are now about 35 organisations involved. If you look online at hashtag early 100, you'll see everything from exhibitions uh, to online events to Heritage Trail and even her work being projected onto Brodick Castle, which I think we'll hear about later. But first, let's hear a bit more about the University of Glasgow and the Hunterians plans from Curator of Art, Andulo. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and uh, to contribute to these celebrations. And in the next five minutes, or maybe six, I will give you a taste of what we are planning here at the Hunterian as part of um, Early 100. Opening late July, as Steph was saying, our exhibition will focus on the artist's legacy, a theme that seems fitting, as we hope that uh, Early 100 will help to ensure she gets the recognition she deserves beyond the Scottish borders. 
Our process of reappraisal is starting with the basics. I'm currently selecting around 20 of the 44 early works now in the university collection, considering how they were acquired and what they tell us about the evolution of her reputation in the last 60, 60 years. Here, I will share with you the example of a small group of early works from the collection of Edwin Morgan, Scotland's first national poet, who found great pleasure in her work and felt bound on more than one occasion to respond to her compelling visual language through his writing. But before I do that, I would like to briefly mention the research currently carried out honoredly by two Emily postgraduate students from the Technical Art History Department at Glasgow University, whose findings will be also highlighted in our show. So with the first slide, um, we look at um, a painting called Salmon Nets and the Sea. You may have recognized it as a background that Steph was using. Um, the first of these students, Melanie, um, is focusing on Salmon Nets and the Sea. For those among you who are not too familiar with the artist, she's best known today for her dedication to two major subjects or locations, the children and tenements of Townsend in Glasgow in the 1950s, and simultaneously, the North East Coast fishing village of Cataline and the landscape, or seascape, should I say as well, around it. One of Erdley's most ambitious, largest works, Salmon Nets is a striking example of her work at Cataline. Now checking the objection file as I was writing this talk, I was reminded of the story behind the acquisition of the painting. In the spring of 1963, seduced by her work, the then director of the Hunterian was looking for a good example to add to the university collection. Not finding anything on the art market, he wrote to the artist asking for her help. And I have included on the screen the first page of the letter which she wrote back to him on the 6th of July, shortly before her untimely death, pointing him to Salmon Nett. First exhibited during her lifetime and included in the 1964 memorial exhibition, Salmon Nett rarely leaves the walls of the Hunter and Art Gallery and is among its most popular works. Painted in the middle of a storm, it captures a favorite, but admittedly difficult subject, salmon nets drying on the shore at Catalin, and conveys the raw power of the sea, its living energy, with that gripping, expressive visual language of hers, entirely her own. And if we could have the next slide, please, I can show you um, a couple of details that uh, Melanie kindly signed me, their close-up of the painting, to help illustrate her intentions. She will start with an investigation into the current state of knowledge around Erdley's works from a technical art history point of view. But she will also look at uh, carrying on an in-depth analysis of the painting, including elements from the landscape stuck onto the picture. And she will look into exploring their potential meaning, for example, Erdley's affinities with the local fishing communities. I hope that you can spot in the close-up on the left, the largest image, the textured area towards the bottom which we have always assumed is due to sand, meaning that the landscape has literally become an inherent part of our canvas. The second close up on the right shows a brown drip of paint whose slight metallic sheen suggests it could be industrial house or boat paint. Establishing the exact nature of this drip will also be part of Melanie's research. And in the next slide, um, we can have a look at what the second student, Amy Johnston, is planning to do uh, working around a painter and painting titled Sweet Shop, Rotten Row. Erdley's painterly depiction of a sweet shop in Rotten Row captures the essence of her celebrated series of works inspired by her glass fronted studio's immediate surrounding in Pan Sand, then a slum in the middle of Glasgow. Amy's comment on the small scale of the painting, which I have put in sort of orange, it appears on the screen. Um, commenting on the small scale of the painting, um, loaded with as much paint as a vast landscape, is a reminder of Erdley's wish to convey a physical sense of surfaces. Here, the rugged and variegated front of the sweet shop by layering thick coats of paint onto the panel. The painting is one of four works by Erdley that came to the Hunterian as part of Edwin Morgan's collection, which he generously gifted in 2004. And if we could have this next slide, please. Um, on this slide, you can see the other three works that were part of his collection. There is a lovely uh, pastel and charcoal titled Grasses, and two oils on panels that are capturing evening skies over the raw 
of cliff cottage, top cottages that overlooks a harbour at Cataline. Um, Erdley started to work intermittently in the isolated fishing village from 1952 and eventually purchased number one in that bay road towards the top of the cliff. All four once decorated the walls of Morgan's Anisland flat in Glasgow. I remember walking around his apartment with my eyes darting from work to work while quizzing him about his collection. It was a curator's dream, actually. Morgan began to buy paintings around 1960 when he moved into a new flat and suddenly had all those empty walls to fill in. In his own words, I got quite a few John Erdley's. Exhibitions of her work were coming out one after the other. She was very, very famous then and her paintings were still relatively cheap to buy. I like her a lot. There is something about her. His purchases of works by Erdley, taking place between 1958 and 1965, epitomized the moment when following the beginning of regular one-person shows, her reputation as a leading artist on the Scottish scene is cemented. No less important is Morgan's role as a champion of Erdley's work, which started when she was still alive. Among his papers, now held at the University of Glasgow's library, are drafts of, of poems inspired by her paintings, which make him an active participant in the development of her legacy. And you can see here that little painting, Sweet Shop, Rotten Row, um, next to the draft for his well-known poem to John Erdley. And um, if you could read um, this uh, um, draft, which appears quite faintly on my screen anyway, uh, you would see the following words. Pearl yellow letters, humbly straggling across the once brilliant red of a broken shop face, confectio, and a blur of children at their games, passing, gazing as they pass at the blur of sweets in the dingy, cosy, rotten row window, and early on my wall. Among Morgan's most cherished possessions, Sweet Shark Rotten Row was one of four works he could not bear to part with when time came for him to move to a nursing home. They only joined the rest of the collection at the Hunterian when he could no longer enjoy them. As a man who often stressed that he liked the idea of having other people enjoying his paintings and how much he got from the Erdleys on his walls, Morgan would no doubt be delighted to know that they are part of Erdley's birthday celebrations. Thank you for listening. And thank you very much. Um, Joan Erdley, as most of you know, uh, died when she was only 42 of breast cancer. But in her last year, she completed the most incredible amount of work, much of which is found in public collections uh, today. And one of them, Two Children, was found on the easel in her town head studio just after she died and is now in the collection of Glasgow Museums. It's one of the paintings that Dr. Joe Meacock, curator of British art at Glasgow Museums, is going to talk about now. Thank you very much. If we can <laughs> see the PowerPoint, thank you. Um, so Glasgow Museums has 24 artworks in its collection by Erdley, five oils and 19 works on paper, including watercolours, pastels and drawings. And we're delighted that as part of um, the centenary celebrations, our entire collection is online. And I'm just going to give you a bit of a gallop through actually some of the highlights in our collection. So bear with me, it's going to be fast paced. So to start with Stackyard from 1947, um, when Erdley was in our growth in, in hospital field. Um, and you'll see it's notable for its really tight and almost claustrophobic linearity. Here Erdley responding to her tutor James Cowie's criticism of her um, loose self-expression. Um, and Glasgow Kids, um, a Saturday matinee picture cue from 1949, um, which was painted just after Erdley returned from um, a travelling scholarship to Italy and France and had a studio on Cochrane Street in the city centre. And she began to draw and to paint the local kids. And here you can see um, the neon lights of the cinema reflected in the faces of these excited kids as they queue for the cinema. Um, and also you can see the impact that this Italian visit had on Erdley in terms of the shallow space and the freeze-like arrangement of figures, you know, the, the impact of these early Italian Renaissance masters. Glasgow Museums has about 15 drawings in its collection um, that were gifted in 1987, if we can move to the next slide, sorry, that were gifted in 1987 by Erdley's sister, um, Pat Black. Um, and 10 of these relate to 
Glasgow kids um, are preparatory drawings like the one that you can see here. Um, and these are on um, creased, dirty paper and whatever Erdley had to hand. And it's really a wonder that they survived, but it showed the value that Erdley placed on such exploratory works and the relationship that they had to finished paintings. I show a detail here from Glasgow Kids and you can see the direct relationship between this drawing and the finished work. And these drawings also highlight the poverty of the kids that Erdley was drawing here eloquently expressed in the ill-fitting trousers of this boy, um, obviously hand-me-downs from an, old, an older sibling. A Glasgow lodging um, from 1953 um, shows how, at this time, critics um, um, were making a connection between Early's work and the Kitchen Sink School of Painters in terms of its humble subject matter. It shows Angus Neal, Early's friend who she met at Hospital Field, um, and she painted him a number of times, most famously nude, um, a painting which was exhibited two years later at the Royal Scottish Academy and caused a furore. But um, Angus is safely in his um, um, army greatcoat here, standing in front of the fireplace of his Montrose Street studio. Most of the um, works in our collection relate to Townhead. Next slide, please, thank you. Here we can see children playing, they're playing hopscotch, they're skipping, they're gathered in a huddle, a cat intertwining among their legs. And the, the visual confusion, the overlapping of forms, the bright colours, the runs in the paint, it's almost like the visual equivalent of the physical energy and the excited cries of the kids as they play. We've got two late pastels in our collection. Um, and these are pastels on glass paper and the tooth of the glass paper really holds the pigment, giving these works um, a richness and a vibrancy, as you can see here. I really like to draw or paint um, pairs of children together, highlighting sibling relationships and friendships. Um, here, I don't think Evelyn and Sadie had posed to early before. This is my personal view, but if you look at their prim pose and their, you know, anxiously clasped hands and their rather nervous eyes, um, that's the impression I get. We can see what a brilliant child portraitist Erdley was. These pastels, this one and another um, pastel, um, were gifted to Glasgow Museums in 2018 by George and Kathleen Buchanan. Now, George Buchanan was a former director of Kelvin Grove, um, and he knew early, and he was responsible for buying this work, A Stormy Sea Number no. One, from exhibition, an important exhibition at the Scottish Gallery in 1961, where it had actually been brought by mistake. Um, Ardley said it was not one of her better works. Um, but it really conveys so powerfully the crashing waves at Catalan and a storm laden sky. And so we're not sorry that this is part of our collection. But probably the most important painting in our collection that Pauline's already alluded to is Two Children which was, as Pauline said, um, left unfinished rather poignantly on Ardley's easel at her death in 1963. Um, and because it's unfinished, it offers unique opportunities to explore Ardley's artistic practice, which we're going to be doing this year. Our conservator is going to be looking at it in some depth. The bright red background and the stenciled lettering, these reference the um, metal store below Ardley's studio in Townhead, um, the graffiti and the found objects, the newspaper, the cigarette papers, the sweetie wrappers, these as well speak so powerfully of, of a place of Townhead, um, which was facing imminent um, demolition. So uh, no matter how abstracted Ardley's works were, they never um, lost a sense of real place, real time and place. The children here are probably two of the Samson kids, and you can see that um, one of them has stuffed a toffee in her mouth or she's giggling or something. They're just so full of character and quite graffiti-like in themselves. I already said they are Glasgow. And we very much hope to get this painting on display during the centenary year. That is before May next year, but I'm afraid we're facing um, some COVID-related delays. But Glasgow Kids is on display in the Looking Art, Art Gallery in Kelvin Grove. And as I said, you can see our entire collection now online. And Ardley, she's one of the most exciting artists to come out of post-war Scotland. Her works are passionate and energetic and dynamic. Um, and this centenary offers the opportunity to um, bring attention to some lesser known works, as well as to enjoy some favourites like this one. Thank you.
Joe, thank you very much. That's definitely one of my favourites as well. And I, I can tell you, I've actually met some of the Samson family. I think there was an exhibition a few years ago and they all walked into the room and you knew immediately, um, you know, who they were from, from those images. It was really quite a, a poignant moment. Um, moving on now, Lila Risco is a curatorial assistant at the National Galleries of Scotland, where um, uh, Joan Erdley and Catalyne opened at the weekend. Um, that's drawn from the permanent collection of early work, which Matilda Hall is very familiar with. Her late husband, Douglas Hall, was the first keeper of the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art, and she herself catalogued the work of many artists, including Joan Erdley. So I'm going to introduce you to them both now. Thanks, Pauline. Uh, and welcome, Matilda. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, so in 1984, you were asked to catalogue over 650 of Joan's drawings, which had remained with her family over the years. Can you tell us how you came to undertake this project and what the process entailed? Well, it was just as for Pat Black, who asked my husband, Daniel's Hall, to find someone suitable to go through the remaining drawings. These were the leftover bits and pieces. So Douglas asked me, and I why not you know, was looking for work at that time. The drawings were lying in a big fat folder that lived under the sofa in the black household, more guy. Periodically a dealer like Sil Gerber would go through them, select what he wanted, and then put the rest back under the sofa. At one point, once they were here, I asked Pat if he would like me to insure them. I suggested maybe a ten or a piece. No, don't worry, she said. I rather mixed feelings about this when I see the current, current prices that they go for. Over the next two years, I went through everything in detail. My job was to catalogue them very carefully and then distribute them appropriately to museums and galleries, marking the residue to return to the family or to sell. Fabulous. Uh, can you tell us where some of the drawings were distributed and how you went about discerning the best places for them? Well, places to offer work, in fact, to offer work to it became pretty obvious. It included the Lily Art Gallery in Mumbai because Pat had asked us to include that. Um, and Glasgow School of Art, which is an Aberdeen Art Gallery, and a few other places which held her work already. Obviously, Glasgow work went to Glasgow and Northern works went to Aberdeen. I wrote to the National Gallery in New Zealand, who owned the seascape. Well, I wrote the letters, but they were all signed by Pat, of course offering them some large drawings of a worn dated lines with the creel, um, they turned them down. Uh, a bit of a missed opportunity, I thought. Well, at Pat's request, the National Gallery were to receive a large share to form a study collection, and something similar went to Aberdeen. Over 200 drawings were then lodged at the National Gallery, and already had several paintings and other work. The three pictures that you see on screen were part of Pat's generous gift. And um, all three of them, I think, no, perhaps mostly the two on the, the central and to the right, you can see examples of what happened. When she had an idea that went beyond the original one, she picked up a piece of paper, tucked it underneath, and simply carried on drawing. It was very much um, a, a habit that you will see in many of the little drawings. This was all pre computer, so I had to be very careful not to make a mistake. You can imagine five carbon copies in a typewriter. Anyway. So, yeah, and uh, just for our audience, I'll just point out that these three uh, drawings that you see on screen, these are all currently on show at the National Galleries at Modern One. So, do please come and see those. Um, so, Matilda, of the more than 650 drawings, how many were marked for sale and how many were returned to the family? Um, there were 151 were marked for sale, uh, which uh, most of it, I can imagine, are now sold. Ten were to return to Pat with the suggestion that they be destroyed. Um, so, most of the ones, most were really distributed to galleries. Okay. And, and I understand that as you were looking through the drawings, you managed to identify certain sequences amongst them. Uh, what could you learn about Joan's manner of working by studying these sequences? Perhaps you could tell us about the three that are on the screen here. What's the, what's the story behind these, do you think? Uh, the story tells itself, really. She comes up over the brow of the hill and beneath her is somebody who's got crutches. He's a fisherman on the bank. The bank becomes obvious later on. He's what I, I would be known then as Michelet de la Guerre, somebody who had lost his limb in the war. I gather that the blue bag that she was sitting on 
is um, a standard issue, part of the severe kit provided by the government. So the first join, she sat down and she joined at the water's end, free and wholly descriptive with his, his food basket and his newspaper. Um, the second drawing, she decided to make um, a more proper image of the little man, make him into a composition, and he goes in his round with beautiful blue and yellow pastels. She's now moved to directly behind him, um, and you can see he's still fishing. And then the third drawing, Pat moves on, and the drawing, and um, she's now looking down at him, he's on the right. Um, you will see he's, he's hot. He's taken his hanky out of his pocket and shoved it underneath his cap. He's actually seen Joan because he's pulled in all the bits and pieces, all tucked in alongside him. And this is a sort of finished work. Um, sharp, bright angles. He was tending to do this a bit in finished works at the time. Well, all three wee works were marked for sale. So if anybody knows who's got them, please go tell the National Gallery. So you were able to roughly date the drawings by noting details about how she was working at any given time? On the whole, yes. You could see how she progressed. These are late. Um, if there are two or three tiny wee drawings about children um, looking out of a window. I'm sorry, the third one is I only have in slide form. You can see the child's got its tongue out, and she, is she trying to lose all the images? Who knows? Anyway, the children persist in remaining there. Um, they're tiny, but they illustrate that she was kind of trying to move toward abstracting things a bit more, but the children simply wouldn't leave the scene. <laughs> Now, another of the late sequences was that of cows going uphill and through the beech grove at the top. Um, imagine my delight when at Catalina I climbed up a bank to the right of the cottages, and there in front of me was a view of the trees bending inwards from the sea. I realised as, as I sat with the cow drawings that the weather had changed, as had Joan's choice of pastels. There are about five or six of these. Again, I thought they would all sell well. The tiny work seemed to have begun faster and faster, and my conclusion is that it got colder, and Joan decided to call it a day after the last dark image. Um, in sorting these drawings, there was one very sad thing, that is that all these images were well, together. Well, I put a lot of them together, they were misplaced quite often, um, so that you could find the sequence. But my job was actually to arrange for their distribution, so we'll never see them in the real together again. It's very sad in a way. Yeah, that's such a shame. Um, and were any of the sequences divided up when the drawings were donated to galleries? No, if any sequence went to the gallery, it went in total. Okay. Um, um, Bill Buchanan's book has this. This is another example of just putting things together. In Bill Buchanan's book, he draws Mrs. Red wallpaper. So this will date from 48, when she was in Lincoln. Um, you can see this is perfect drawing again, completely spontaneous and beautifully delineated. Note the chair with the, the arms with the black leather things in two pictures, um, and the things along the wall are all very much the same. This is red wallpaper is weary. Um, it's quite warm weather because the range is not on. The kettle and the cat are on the range, um, and the basin is on the table. Well, among the Italian drawings, I found the middle image, and he's clearly missed a red wallpaper because the chair is identical to the one in the in the in the in the, in the final oil paintings. Um, there was this pack of elderly, well, rolled up paintings that lived underneath the sofa against the wall, and Pat said, "I'll just throw them out, shall I? We'll just get rid of them." No, 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 no! We shouted, and they all made their way to National Gallery Conservation Department to be done just in time, to be restored, conserved, just in time. Um, and again, these all went on to private collections of one sort or another. Um, the, 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 in the oil, the good lady is stiffer. The weather's changed. She's drying clothes by the fire. The two chairs are identical. Some of the objects on the wall are the same. Putting these things together was a, a tremendous excitement. You could see how carefully she planned everything. And it was a real pleasure. Oh. And what kind of condition were the drawings in? You said they were kept in a big folder and stored under Pat's sofa. Well, so they... uh, 
you might well imagine that no fixative had ever been used, and many of the drawings had charcoal and general grub. Um, often they were quite brown at the edges, rubbed off one against the other. Some were rendered so ugly that from the National Gallery Conservation Department, I got tissue paper, a special rubber for cleaning up. They recommended using bread to rub off the charcoal, and this I mostly used. I was truly hesitant, but one or two really needed cleaning up and profit greatly by this. And uh, only I know which ones those are. But of course, we, I, I repaired the, the back of the fragile ones, um, and there was acid-free tissue paper between everything. I see. And did you have any particular favorites amongst the drawings you were working with? Yes, 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 I can. There are three little images now in Aberdeen um, of the barn. Um, immediately above the top of this picture is where the beech trees uh, facing inwards are. Um, now, the first one was the watercolour, and here you can see that she is using some sort of resistance. It was one of several new techniques she was trying. So, a very pretty watercolour of the burn, a sometime burn, not always, but when it was raining, there was a lot of water around coming down. Um, the, the next one she did was a black and white drawing. She became interested in a particular brush of grasses that stuck out over the corner and they're quite deeply etched in and you can see the fence and the post in that one. The third, a very unknown cat and line with ditch, um, very, well not unknown, I'm sorry but I mean it's very difficult but I believe that that belongs in the sequence. Um, Yes, I was asked if I would like to have a drawing. And I said, oh, well, there is a particular little painting I, I would like. Um, I did late, obviously, with paint and plaster all over the edges, unwanted except by me, because I saw it as a conclusion to the little sequence of tiny drawings. It is with me, it's behind me on the screen to the right, you can see. Um, and I guess it had rained on the plaster surfaces and this gives very nice wet splodges, which in a way are echoed by the wax resist. Mm. Uh, and if you were to remark upon the set of drawings as a whole, to kind of give your impression of that aspect of Joan's working practice, how would you sum it up? Well, I, of course, I lived with it closely for some two years. Mm. Um, and to my mind, I don't know if anybody else agrees with me, um, some, only some of the oil paintings, not least those of Catiline, tend to make one feel that Joan was almost closed in by the light. The skies are generally very heavy, um, overcast, heavy written down summer sun or February fogs. Her drawings are the complete opposite. They show such an evident delight in what was immediately in front of her. And every tiny piece of paper became to me a kind of jewel in the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks so much, Matilda. Um, it's been really lovely to hear you share your memories and uh, I could continue talking with you about this for a lot longer, but I'm afraid we're out of time. So uh, I'll hand back over to Pauline and just say thanks again, Matilda. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Lila, and thank you, Matilda. And I agree with you. I, I would happily hear uh, so much more. It's fascinating to hear how much you can read Yes. about Joan's practice from you know like just by examining her, her her work it puts me in mind of that um fantastic photograph of Joan at work in Catiline out on the cliff tops mm -hmm. and and the story that I'm sure Anne can tell us whether it's true or not later about how she used to actually jump on a train out of Glasgow whenever she heard there was a gale forecast because she wanted to to capture that weather so it's lovely to be able to picture that you know get a sense of how she worked as well as the work she produced. So thank you to you both. And uh, just a reminder as well that um, anyone who's uh, listening in at the moment, because of course we can't see you all, but we know you're out there. We've got 500 plus uh, people logged on at the moment. If you would like to ask anything of Matilda or of Lila or of any of the other panelists who you've heard from so far, then do pop your questions into the Q&A and we'll get a little bit of time at the end uh, to talk to them some more. Now, moving onwards to another side of, of Joan's work, Nick Curnow is Head of Fine Art Departments at Lyon and Turnbull auctioneers but he's also joint vice chairman of the company and he's worked there for close to four decades so he's very well placed to tell us a little bit more about John Erdley's work at auction. 
Good afternoon, and uh, it would be inappropriate, I think, to talk about the commercial world of Joan Eardley without mentioning the dealers uh, with whom she worked initially. So I've broadened the, broadened the scope of what I'm going to say uh, a little bit. Um, despite how it might appear, uh, the role of the academic and commercial world is much closer than one might think. Both are concerned with promoting and fostering interest in an artist's life and work, and both use biographical references alongside detailed art historical analysis to assess and explain the artist's methods of working and output. Much has been written about Erdley's career with several excellent exhibitions and monographs, and further research will doubtless uncover additional previously unconsidered aspects of her life and work, and I look forward to Patrick Elliott's forthcoming book to see what he has to add to the mix. A mention should also be made of what a welcome addition to the early debate was occasioned by the docudrama performed by the Eroica Theatre, both at the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art, but also with us at Lan and Turnbull, and the further performances throughout Scotland and the UK, which have helped spread the word about what a remarkable person and artist Erdley was. Erdley's story, however, did not end with her death, and as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of her birth, it is equally pertinent to acknowledge those in the commercial world who have helped keep her name at the forefront of 20th century British painting throughout the last 50 years. Two galleries in particular deserve special mention. The Scottish Gallery, whose then director, Bill Macaulay, was so enthusiastic about Erdley's work that he managed to persuade her to paint his children. Erdley was generally unhappy about accepting commissions and held a festival exhibition of 133 works immediately following her death. Since then, barely a year has gone by without Erdley appearing in a Christmas show or every four or five years in a solo exhibition. Cyril Gerber of the Compass Gallery and subsequently Gerber Fine Art held a similar place in the West. Jill, Cyril's daughter, told me of regular visits to Erdley's sister to select works for forthcoming shows and frequent appearances in group events and a number of solo exhibitions where witness to an ongoing relationship with the family built up over decades. Indeed, both Jill Gerber and Guy Peplow were at pains to stress how important this relationship was in helping promote Joan's work year in, year out. The auction world has also played its part in promoting Joan's work. As a primarily secondary market, it was not really until the 1980s that Erdley's work began to appear on the auction market on a regular basis. Having been around probably longer than I should have been, I happened to look out an old catalogue of mine from 1989. There were four Erdleys in the sale, two oils and two pastels, with provenances going back to 1955, 61 and 64. Prices compared to today were modest, perhaps a quarter to a fifth of what they might currently realize. But they're aware of assuming everything goes up. However, as there were also a number of paintings in that sale that have come down in value subsequently. Where does Erdley sit today? In 2000, we were fortunate to be able to sell this well-documented painting, Andrew with a comic. From the collection of the distinguished Scottish author, Naomi Mitchison, it realized a then record auction price of 100,000 pounds. In the intervening years, this price has been beaten less frequently than you might imagine. And the current highest auction price is 170,000. To my mind, this is not a reflection of a lack of demand. For over the years, we've sold a number of very nice, but modest examples at strong prices. This little oil of a girl's head measured only 10 inches by 10 inches, but realized 50,000. This charming still life measured 12 inches by 13 and made 35,000. And this view of a Glasgow tenement, again, only 12 inches by 14, realized 50,000. Part of the issue, I think, lies with Erdley's very demand. Major examples of Erdley's work are not appearing on the market as they pass from one generation to the next, as equally appreciated in 2020 as they were in 1960. This is, of course, not in itself a bad thing, and it's encouraging that Erdley's appeal transcends the generation. 
What is less helpful in broadening interest in Erdley's work, however, is that major works create major prices and provide copy and column inches for those that commentate on art and the art market. Record prices can help reignite interest in an artist's work much in the same way as some new research or new exhibition. Have we all managed to extend an appreciation of Erdley's art, therefore? Talking to Guy and Jill and checking our own records, we are making some progress. We are all finding buyers further afield than the primarily Scots or Scots diaspora who bought Jones' work in the past. But the market is still not as widespread as I would like, and more importantly, than she deserves. I had heard that with sponsorship money available to take the last major early show to London, but sadly, no venue. In his introductory essay to an exhibition of Erdley's work at Stirling University in 1969, Douglas Hall, who we've heard of before, wrote that Scotland had in Joan Erdley a painter of world class, but that she has not yet been seen in England in the really comprehensive form necessary for her powers to be realised. I like the idea of the upper galleries at the Royal Academy, or failing that, Pallant House, where the last Ferguson exhibition was shown. Sponsorship, anyone? Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, Nick, uh, for that uh, as well. Again, another interesting uh, facet uh, of, uh, of Joan's work. Um, Joan Erdley didn't have any children of her own, but her ability to capture the reality of childhood is unmatched. I've mentioned that I've met and interviewed some of the Samson family who lived near her and appear, appear in all those wonderful paintings with their vivid red hair and their wonky smiles and their skint knees. And I'm told there's at least one commissioned work of other children uh, painted in the 1950s. Um, someone has asked, and we'll ask Anne about this later, about whether Joan... Um, made any paintings of her own family, uh, but she did make something for her own family. A very personal and unusual work is in the Paisley Museum collection. It's a playpen with animals uh, designed by Joan for the family of her friend. It's now in the Paisley Museum collection and curated of art there, Dr Victoria Irvin and the Assistant Director of Heritage Collections to be and curation at the University of St Andrews, Dr Katrina McCarrot. They join us now to talk about the playpen and the idea of play in Joan Erdley's work. Thank you, Pauline. We can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Paisley Museum houses a playpen decorated by Joan Erdley in the late 1940s. We know of one other playpen and both were painted for family or friends. These objects have been excluded from Erdley's output, perhaps because they are unknown, Yet I feel that outright dismissal precludes wider conversations about the intersection of our interest in childhood culture with these personal projects. This playpen is fascinating and surely provides crucial insights into understandings of Erdley's broader worldview. The high art, low art dichotomy was still very prevalent when this was made, but that was all about to change. Art historical thinking on craft has been significantly, significantly revised since then, and maybe we need to further revise considerations of Erdley's output using a contemporary feminist language. Feminist readings of Erdley's contemporary reviews indicate the gendered language she was subject to, admired for her fidelity and mastery of paint. This language in part accorded Erdley status because it united, to paraphrase feminist art historian Griselda Pollock, creativity with stereotypically masculine painterly qualities. We know that this is not new, so I'm interested in your idea that we can use contemporary feminist language to provide a more nuanced discussion of our work as it relates to childhood. So how might we begin that discussion? So I'm interested in art by women in the immediate post-war era and how they might provide a model for a work-life balance. The English artist Leonora Carrington made a series of night nursery paintings in Mexico City and even collaborated on a cradle with Jose Horner. The boat for them was symbolic of wartime exile and is painted with moons and creatures that likely owe their allegiance to the picture book illustrations of Carrington's own childhood Edwardian nursery, for example, Arthur Rackham and Beatrix Potter. Did Eardley have interest in the so-called golden age of picture books or even a collection of her own? 
I'm glad you raised the post-war environment when materials were scarce and imagery had this newfound significance. Yes, Airdley did read 1920s editions of Beatrix Potter, Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland and so forth. Airdley's niece, Anne Morrison Hudson, also read the same copies as a child. And we can clearly see that Airdley was inspired by Beatrix Potter's illustrations in the example of, for example, you can see here Tabitha Twi Twitchett and Jemima Puddle Duck. Prior to gifting both pl playpens, we know that Airdley made and illustrated a book of nursery rhymes in 1940, which was exhibited at the Glasgow School of Art Club show when she was a student there. So tell me, do the moons and creatures of Carrington's cradle further symbolise an escape signified by childhood? So Carrington's nocturnal creatures and moons could be said to relate to the night nursery and post-war lullabies, like Margaret Wise Brown's Good Night Moon, 1947. Meanwhile, Walt Disney signified that story time was about to begin with a big, heavy, gilt-edged tomb being opened. Carrington also had a reproduction of Margaret Winifred Tarrant's The Gates of Fairyland, 1922, where the children serve as the link between reality and the enchanted characters of Storyland. It's interesting that the illustrators Leonora Carrington and Joan Eardley relate to are mostly women. Tell me more about Eardley's illustrated book. What nursery rhymes did it contain? Are book and playpen one-off projects, or did she do further commissions like this alongside her painterly practice? Ah, this tantalising reference to Eardley's illustrated book came from a fellow student, Christine Emily Crammond. And unfortunately, as far as we know, the book is now lost, so we're only really able to speculate as to its contents. As far as the Eardley family are aware, I believe that the book and the playpens were one-off projects. Although childhood in some form featured in Airdley's early work. As for wider cultural context, Fiona Pearson's research in Airdley has already identified that the artist was painting in the era of Iona and Peter Ophi, who studied children's folklore, so the recording of nursery stories and children's street games. Airdley also read the picture post, which has been cited as significant in terms of its 1948 article, The Forgotten Gorbals, which featured photographs of children by Bert Hardy and Bill Brandt. How interesting that Airdley worked from such diverse sources, from picture book illustration to documentary photography, yet both with a focus on childhood subjects and perspectives. This seems singularly unique in mid 20th century painting. Does her use of such photographic subjects in her painting shed further light on her feminism or feminist readings of her work? Eardley's association with photography is well documented and her understanding of Glasgow as a place where people and city were wholly connected, I think relies partly on this heritage of documentary photography. Eardley carried a camera with her from about 1953 and used documentary images of graffiti, children's clothing and so forth as more, as a, as more than an aid memoir. I think Cordelia Oliver referred to Eardley's sketching and photographs as a kind of visual feeding, which I quite like. I think the language around photography in Eardley um, has not really been fully examined in terms of feminism, which is surprising given contemporary women practitioners in the field. Here's something which interests me. Sarah Stevenson referred to the juxtaposition of realism and surreality in Eardley's photographs. So for example, the photographic distortion of a real person. This dichotomy seems present in Eardley's work more generally. So social realism and abstract expressionism. And I think it chimes with this conversation to reality and storybook illustrations. She was obviously highly sensitive and alert to the cultural ephemera and social landscape around her, combining these different aspects, almost collage-like into her innovative painterly practice. So in sum, what does it mean, I wonder, for a pioneering woman pursuing an aesthetically advanced creative practice to live off a craft-based side project at that historical moment? And finally, Victoria, can we understand Eardley better through exploration of her childhood motifs? I think it means that we should remind ourselves to continually adjust this prism through which we view the work of women artists. Yes, the playpens were personal projects and not intended for exhibition, yet this does not mean that they are less historically significant than some of her oils. I think you said it earlier, this narrative between domestic and amateur, craft or less than, has existed long before the 19th century and is historically implicit in the work of women artists. Both playpens speak more broadly to Eardley's visual bank of sources and her interest in children, and her interest in children. And I think as you've demonstrated, show that we can start to contextualize Eardley's output with some nuance 
rather than thinking of her within traditional art historical canons. So what offer women colleagues like Dorothy Steele and Margot Sandeman? What offer women peers in the UK and internationally? And which other women were working in child subjects at this time? More generally, I believe that the playpens and references to the picture books reinforce that Airdley was a storyteller. Above all, as she said herself, the story part of it does matter. Thank you. Dr. Victoria Irvin and also Dr. Katrina McCara, thank you very much. That was a really enlightening um, avenue, one that I've not heard so much said about before. And also it plants another notion of another lost work somewhere, this not lost uh, nursery rhyme book, along with uh, uh, the other one that fascinates me is the lost mural. There's a lost fashion mural somewhere. Well, it may not even exist, but it's still, it's fascinating to sort of think of all these um, Joan Erdley works that may still be out there and who knows, perhaps we'll, we'll find them again. Thank you for that. Where there are children, there are sweet shops. There is a link, bear with me. Jan Patience is an arts journalist and editor, uh, Herald's arts writer, among many things. She's got a passion for all art, but especially Erdley. Um, Jan is going to focus on a particular friendship which sprang up between Joan Erdley and Edwin Morgan and involves that very Scottish of subjects, sweeties. So welcome to the Lily Art Gallery in Mogai, which is one of my favourite galleries because it's on my doorstep and it also has amazing shows. Uh, it also has an amazing collection of Joan Erdley works. And I've been in here several times and been just rocked back in my heels because the work is just phenomenal. They've got a new e exhibition which opens today, the 18th of May, which is very fitting, Joan's birthday. and. Um, I wanted to particularly look at this picture today because it's particularly relevant. It's like one of Joan Erdley's late seascapes. And uh, in, her, in her later years, I mean, she died when she was 42, so she was quite young. Uh, but in her last years, she turned her attention while she was in Catiline to the sea. And uh, it actually took her quite a few years of being in Catiline to, to look at the sea, to paint the sea, to tackle it. But it was obviously something which uh, she, she was very keen to do because it sort of reflected all moods and uh, for her observation was everything. So it was almost as though she was watching, watching, watching the sea in all its, on all its moods, in all its sort of vagaries. And uh, she, she maybe thought she couldn't capture it because it was so tricky. Um, but I think during the course of the 50s, there was some interesting things going on in, in world art movements, abstract expressionism over in America, in, in Europe, the Tashis, which were sort of often described as the, the sort of abstract expressionists of Europe. Um, so she would be aware of both. Paul, you know, Jackson Pollock had a big exhibition in London in 1958, and she would be also aware of the Tashis, and I think there was a, an exhibition of de Stael, Nicola de Stael, in Edinburgh uh, in the late 50s. Um, so she was very aware of their methods. It was about ab abstraction, about capturing emotion through paint, which is a really difficult thing to do, because painting can sometimes be very tight um, and very, you know, just representational. But what she was trying to do and I mean, I, sat, I sort of turn around and I see this painting now and it just sort of, it's always got the same effect. It's just, she was trying to paint the sea, but trying to paint emotions at the same time. You look at it, there's flashes of blue, really intense blue, flashes of yellow. So you can almost feel Erdley doing this sort of thing, which is what she did. She really, really put her absolute soul into it. She would stand on the, the shoreline at Catalan almost you know, she would be tied down, the canvas would be tied down. Now this is a big canvas and in the wind it would have been blowing a hooli and she would have been, you know, blowing a hooli with it. It's got rain in, it's got, you know, the kind of water would have gone onto the canvas mixed with the oil. So it's really, you can just see the energy here, a splash of white with the foam and the spume. So, this for me, I mean, I've come in here and I've looked at it and you sort of, you just feel yourself inside this painting. It was really quite astonishing and it's, a, you know, a late painting. So she was coming into her own, sadly, 
by the time she was dying. This was painted in 1962, quite a late painting. She died the, the next year. So um, interestingly, it was voted one of Scotland's 10 most favourite paintings in a public collection. And it was voted on by readers of the Herald newspaper, which is a newspaper I work for and I, I write about art for. And uh, it, the 10 paintings were uh, picked by Edwin Morgan, who was then the, the sort of poet laureate of Scotland. Uh, and, you know, he was a great elderly fan. He uh, just sent one day 10 poems about all the paintings to the, 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 the poetry editor, Leslie Duncan, this landed in the post one day. And he obviously was a great John Eardley fan. He had a, a small Eardley in his own art collection. And he'd written about that also, about the confectionery shop in Townhead. So um, he wrote about this painting. And uh, I'd like to read it now because I can witter on all day or I can just say what Edwin Morgan says because he says it so much better. So the poem is called Flood Tide, Joan Erdley. Lonely people are drawn to the sea, not for this artist, the surge and glitter of salons, clutch of a sherry or making polite conversation. See her when she is free, striding into the salty bluster of a cliff top in her paint splashed corduroys humming as she recalls the wild, shy boys. She sketched in the city, allowing nature's nations of grasses and wild, shy flowers to stick to the canvas they were blown against by the mighty Catalan wind. All becomes art, and as if it was incensed by the painter's brush, the sea growls up in a white flood. The artist's cup is overflowing with what she dares to think is joy. Caught unawares, as if on the wing, a solitary clover, unable to read wet paint, rolls over once, twice, and then it's fixed. Part of a field more human than the one that took the gale and is now, as she is beyond the sun. Jan, thank you very much. And there is an Edwin Morgan um, poem about the sweetie shop, which you will have to look up yourselves in case you wonder what on earth I was talking about. Um, it does connect in uh, to that. and it, is, uh, it does connect up to a picture you've already seen. Now, Joan Erdley first came to Scotland in 1939 to Otterarder, but from there, life took her to various places around the country, from Glasgow, where she was one of a reduced number who studied at Glasgow School of Art during the Second World War and met her friend Margot Sandeman, who in turn introduced her to the island of Arran. Now this year, Arran has launched an Arran Art Heritage Trail, which identifies 20 key locations across the island, which have offered inspiration to artists and continue to do so today. Like many of you, I can't wait to go to follow the trail in person, but meantime, here's the project manager, Ruth, Ruth Embe, to tell us more. Hi Pauline, thanks so much and thanks so much for having me. It's wonderful to be able to be here today to celebrate uh, Joan Ardley's centenary. Um, I'm not going to speak for more than a, a minute. Uh, that I would like the film just to um, explain itself really. Um, but I think what we've been really trying to do in the film is to look at Joan through the lens of Aaron, particularly her formative years, um, painting and spending time there with Margot Sandyman. So the film is called Tabernacle. And it was especially commissioned by the Aran Arts Heritage Trail to document the importance of Joan's time spent painting on Aran during her formative years, as I've said. Um, Joan spent long summers with her lifelong friend and fellow artist, Margot Sandyman, who she met, met at Glasgow School of Art, exploring Aran's landscapes, cottages and people, um, and painting at the Tabernacle, which was their studio come cottage and their time spent there. Um, and Joan and Margot share a place marker um, in Corrie, one of the 20 that Pauline mentioned on the trail to mark their time spent there. The film was directed by the trails appointed young filmmaker Simon Sloan, and the script was written in collaboration with Heroica Theatre Company, who wrote and produced the play Joan Erdley, A Private View in 2019, sorry, 2017, which uh, Nick mentioned earlier on. 
and it is narrated by the broadcaster and writer Kirsty Walk. And on behalf of the Aran Arts Heritage Trail, I do hope you enjoy it. Autumn 1944. Joan Airdley writes to her friend Margot Sandeman from Corrie, Aran. The picture I painted yesterday was of a fir tree in the castle wood from the shore part of the Brodick Road. I tried hard to finish it, but I haven't quite. About 11 o'clock, deluges of rain came on and I felt absolutely fed up. And then suddenly I thought I wasn't going to be beaten by the blast of rain again. So I erected a little tent over my canvas with my Mac and your bike and some pieces of rope. It must have looked pretty funny to the people from the road. Today it is raining too, only this time there's a hurricane as well, and I don't think the little tent would stay up. Joan Eardley first visited Aaron in 1942 at the invitation of her lifelong friend Margot Sandman. They stayed in Corrie, a small coastal community on the east coast of Aaron, five miles north of Brodick. The villages of Corrie and High Corrie were renowned by artists from Scotland, Europe and beyond through Jessie M. King and her husband E.A. Taylor's summer school, which ran from 1911 to 1939. And it was into this resonant, nurturing atmosphere with pretty whitewashed cottages, raw seascapes, petulant weather and ever-changing light that Airdly began to experiment and hone her style. This tiny two-storey bothy, the Tabernacle, became studio and home to Joan and Margot during their trips to Aaron, with a loft bedroom upstairs and the small downstairs room providing for everything else, it became the hub of their friendship, exploration and liberation to sketch and paint as they saw fit. Indeed, Joan was noted for her unusual dress sense and at the old port, dressed in baggy trousers and a too big jacket, grasping her easel and paints, staring out to sea, one Corrie resident recalls at the age of five, offering her his pocket money as he thought she must be a poor woman. It was here in Corrie that Joan met her elderly neighbour, Mrs Jeannie Kelso, wee Jeannie, who became a regular model for Joan's pen and ink studies, as did the cosy, cluttered domestic cottage interiors, living room hearths and black iron stoves. And it was also from here that Joan and Margot would have ventured out into the landscapes to paint. Just look at this gorgeous view right over to Holy Isle. It's not the view I'm after. The light then. I'm not having this again, Joan. We come here to paint, don't we? Because we think we're painters. And if you give it all up in one of your rages, then that'll be the end of us. The end of our trips to Arran. No more tabernacle to stay in. No more genie and our soup and bread, eh? Ah, oh, it's clear to the top today. I'm going to be brave and strike out for the summit. Coming? No. Ask Jeannie if she'll keep me back some soup. I'll sketch her this evening as a thank you. Oh, you and your portraits. I wish I had your gift. It's not a gift. I have to slog at it. But it's simple, really. I paint what I love, who I love. It's the blasted light, Margot. It keeps shifting. Then make that your challenge, to capture it, work out how to take hold of whatever it is. Don't just give up on it. Oh, do look, Joan. Just look at what the light's doing right now. It's making the darknesses of the fell side sort of fold into each other. They seem to drown their own contours, don't they? The silver-edged cloud bank just swallowing up the outlines. The sunlight sort of splitting them into layers, refraction through the clouds, like a second-hand glow. Inventing a whole new palette colour bathing the valley and lifting into the sky. Shafting through the darkness, not really blue anymore, but layers and layers of cream and purple, purple and cream. 
Don't let it get away then. Urgency, energy, courage, ferocious strength and tenderness are words used to describe Airlie's work. And these sensibilities are present in her first seascape painted here in Corrie on Arran. Her painting, Corrie Shore, is a hint of what was to come in her later work. Indeed, her time spent on Arran exploring themes, capturing light, battling the elements and developing techniques was foundational for her future work. Sorry, I should put my video back on. <laughs> Some lovely images there um, on Aaron, giving me a real urge to, to, to be there. So thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Ruth. Now, listening in uh, across the afternoon has been Anne Morrison Hudson, who's Joan's niece and an artist in her own right. And I wonder if, um, I wonder if Anne wants to responds to some of the things that she's seen and heard. I'd imagine most of it isn't new to you, but at the same time, there's been some sort of interesting elements that maybe you weren't familiar with. Yes, I think there's some interesting things. I think all the research that's been going on by uh, everybody, it, it just keeps throwing up um, new little bits of details, which makes it um, all the more interesting to, to um, sort of look into to everything. Um, but yes, I think uh, it's, you know, fantastic uh, what everybody's been doing and um, just delighted the, the interest that has been shown in her work. There were a few questions and, and uh, anyone who's uh, still uh, tuned in and uh, listening and watching is welcome to ask some more, but there's some quite interesting um, questions that have been submitted uh, so far. Aisha was asking if John ever painted any of the members of her own family. No, apparently my mother did ask her, but she just really wasn't interested the children she was interested in were the, the the Glasgow children you know I think they were much more interesting we were just you know part of the family and uh, the the only time she did do a, a commission to paint children was um Bill Macaulay's children Bill Macaulay was the the uh, owner of the the Scottish gallery in Edinburgh and very important uh, to her career um, and I think um, she did do that, but she was not, um, she didn't, she certainly didn't enjoy doing it, put it that way. Yes. Um, but, but I mean, it's, it's an interesting um, sort of set of portraits in a line and, and the, the family still own that. I was going to say that she's interested in a very specific thing with the Samson family isn't she it's the way they look it's the fact that there's a there's a vividness to them and I'm not suggesting that your family were not vivid looking but there's a particular uh, kind of look and that might also explain the other question that um, I'm seeing here is that someone is saying it's fascinating that Erdley never painted the children of Catiline and I wonder if that's for the same reason and also maybe there weren't so many of them maybe they weren't so I don't think there were that many children there um, I know there was one or two because uh, um, Ron Stevens was one that, that uh, met and, and uh, was there as a child. But I don't think, I think because she painted the children in Glasgow, I think when she went to Catiline, it was everything round about, um, you know, the, the landscape and, and that that's what interested her. I think it was the children in their environment. I think that was very important. To, to the way she painted them, even the wee sketches of them, you know, where, where there is no background, it's just the children, but it's catching them in their sort of characteristic, um, sort of shabby, you know, um, scruffy clothing and, and things like that. It was just catching the reality of them, you know, that, that, that she was interested in. I mean, several of the panelists um, talked about her photography 
and uh, the, the the photographs and we saw we saw some examples and this kind of ties into a question that Judith Sheeler has asked did Joan ever use her images of Glasgow children politically in order to improve their conditions and I wonder if that's more about the photographs than than uh, the paintings yeah I mean she uh, yes I mean there are a lot of photographs and you know of of you know the, the walls the buildings and the children and catching the children playing and all the rest of it but no the one thing and it is recorded in one of the um uh, pieces that was recorded by her uh just very at the end of her life um that she no they were not done as political statements there was nothing she never did it as a political social comment it was just her interest in who they were and how they were that she wanted to put out and I think that's um yeah I think I think that has to be said she wasn't doing it for any um political reason um uh that wasn't that wasn't her interest she was interested in who they were and and how they live but but not in not 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 yeah making it for change I'm sure she didn't like the way they they were um you know how poor they were but uh, that was it yeah it wasn't her place to to change it really it's interesting though I guess that she still documents a, a place that changed utterly you know that it's a, a place that is not the same and she's again within those uh paintings they are places that are no longer what, what they were. oh yes I mean I think it's wonderful that she has actually recorded these things I mean there were a lot of other photographers around at the time who were taking pictures of, of the poorer areas and, and everything and, and the buildings getting knocked down but she I think she puts in I suppose it's her own personal vision into the way she she recorded it all um but yes I mean it was it was you know it was disappearing literally before our eyes because there's quite a number of little um sort of end of tenements we still see the wallpaper and all that sort of and the fireplace is still there where half the blocks got knocked down so that there was interesting you know it's all these little details and everything she painted and the the, the Catiline paintings if you look at them you know they absolutely depict the cliffside and the little funny rocks that there are there you can always see it's it is Catiline there's no question it's nowhere else mm. and I like that there's, there's something really interesting about her relationship between the two places it, it, is that true that sort of idea that she would keep an eye on the weather and if there was a game forecast she would be up to Catiline it, yeah yes I believe that's true that, that somebody would phone down and let her know that there was a big storm coming in and uh, she would jump on the train and uh, go up to um, well Stonehaven, and she kept her uh, wee scooter at Stonehaven, and would then then get herself down to, um, uh, yeah, uh, down to Catiline. And she did not take her scooter um, and drive it all the way up from Glasgow because that and her wee Lambretta scooter would have. That would have been horrendous. <laughs> a bit of a journey, wouldn't it? But I love, yeah. I love the fact she's immersed in in both uh, communities. I love that quote about. Um, from one of the residents in Catalina said she lived quietly amongst us. Uh, you know, there is that sort of sense that she's completely immersed in either community. Whenever she's in Townhead, she's where, who she needs to be. Whenever she's in Catalina, she's who she needs to be. Yes, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, that yes, yeah, she 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 seemed to get on with the people so well that were there. Um, I think. Um, yeah, but, and, and I think even, uh, you know, when she went over to uh, Corrie uh, on Aaron, there's, again, it's the, the older people, she seemed to have a very much a rapport with them. Well, she lived uh, with her um, mother and grandmother, um, you know, so she was used to sort of having the, the you know, maybe the, the, the older generation around as part of the family. So she, she seemed to have a great rapport with, with, with them. And again, when she was in Italy, um, you know, she she drew the the the, the older people, um, and and uh, you know, and capturing them in in a just in a a marvelous way, you know, their sort of knobbly fingers and sort of lined faces. She could capture them in a very a very um, precise and uh, way, and yet uh, you know, giving their character. Um 
Someone else, uh, Gillian Park, asks here, what happened to her Townhead studio? What happened to her easels, tools, etc.? We heard about the last painting there. Is there a chance of an exhibition incorporating some of these? No, there's there's not much. Um, the, 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 the studio was a very old um, studio. Uh, it had been a photographer's studio. Um, I mean, my father was brought up in Townhead when it was a much better um, area, uh, uh, you know, in the in the, the 20s. Um, and uh, it was a photographer's studio and she took it on. And I mean, there was scaffolding poles holding it up um, when she was using it. Um, no, I don't think there was there was not much uh, left. Everything had to be cleared out uh, and the, the building was knocked down eventually. The interesting thing is, I, I suppose, you know, I, I'm, I'm second guessing what the, the person asking the question is, is thinking, but you're trying to get a sense of how she worked and what she was doing. But from what Matilda was saying, you can read all that. You can get an understanding of all that from her actual uh, paintings and, 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 and drawings, but also from her own letters, you get a sense of what she's doing, how she likes to be out, out of doors when she's, she's painting, all the things that she's using to, to work. Yes, and I think that's actually one of the interesting things um, that um, I, I feel that there's more to be looked into to actually tie up some of the, the things referred to in the letters and see if we can find, you know, those particular paintings and drawings. But looking into all the drawings and sketches, there is, um, there, there's a whole lot of uh, details that you can pick out. And as Matilda said, that, that there are series where there, she has drawn and redrawn the same things and uh, capturing them, well, sometimes at Catiline, just as, as the, the weather changed, um, you know, and it, it, it's interesting to, to look in and then find, and I mean, that there's a painting that's just turned up um, from a drawing uh, that is in Aberdeen uh, of fishing nets, um, because these things just suddenly come back on the market again, it's coming up for auction. And we didn't know that painting still existed. So there's things that are still happening and little bits of interest that are, that are uh, you know, still keep turning up. And do um, you think the centenary celebrations that actually sort of marking the centenary is helping with that, is helping, you know, we've got the technology now, we can be a bit kind of better linked up. Are you oh, finding things? Yeah, yes, yes, lo lots of things. Yes, um, yes, I've been a bit inundated with, with lots of questions and things. Not that it, no, that's, that's fine. Um, but yes, there's a lot of things happening and I think it has changed um, the, the way uh, all, all the, the different collections and things have come together more in putting this together, um, which I think is good because otherwise I think, you know, people look at their own collections and don't link them together. So I think there's a whole lot of um, things that, that can, uh, uh, there's a, still a whole lot to be learned, I'm sure. And also we mentioned some of the ones that are, are sort of slightly mysterious. We have no idea if they are still out there. You mentioned that, you know, there's a painting that you didn't know was there and it is there. I, I had read about that mural that she made in Lincolnshire that we don't know. Uh, that ever. unfortunately is totally gone. And and um, I, I know my mother tried to see, but there was no, there's apparently no photographs of it either. Um, and uh, the building and everything is gone. It was in a school, uh, an old house, I think, that became a girl's school uh, and she painted it. There, there was some family connection in, uh, with the school. I'm not quite sure. Uh, what it was but but she was asked to do it and uh, no that's that's apparently long gone so even photographs of it or details no of no as we've never ne never traced anything of it it was in Lincolnshire somewhere I don't even know if we've got the name of where it was I'm sure it is somewhere but that's the trouble is the too many little bits of details are you hopeful with something like this that you know her, her world reputation has definitely risen in the last few years it's it, you know when you look at the numbers that are logged on today in 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 Scotland and the international uh, connections do you feel that the, she's beginning to 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 get the reputation that she deserves well I yes I think I think there's definitely more interest um outside of Scotland and, and yes she absolutely deserves to be and I think I mean it's, it's very sad just when she died she would had just had 
you know, her biggest exhibition, solo exhibition in London. And had she lived, I'm sure she would have become a household name throughout Britain and probably abroad. Um, and I think it's very sad that, I think that is why her, her reputation just sort of disappeared elsewhere, other than in Scotland where people just, I don't know, I think maybe coming from the colorist tradition, I think her work kind of almost fits into a sort of next generation on kind of thing. And, and people have always, always been, been interested in her work. There's a real uh, passion for her work. Oh, absolutely, yes. There's yes. something, you know, very lovely about this woman who comes to Scotland and, and none of it seems totally planned you know, where she ends up, the places she goes to, it's usually friends that connect her to Aaron or to Catiline or, you know, even, you know, Drimmon initially, all these places, they're, they're come almost accidents on, on route, they're not planned. Yes, it does appear that way, yes, yes, because she just found Catiline because she, she had the exhibition in, in Aberdeen and got the mumps and had to stay there till she, <laughs> till she, she recovered, so, um, and a friend took her out to Catiline and um, and she just loved the, the countryside. Yeah, and then so, so that gets under her skin, but equally it becomes a place that it will be forever known through her. Yes, yes, yes. You can't see Catalan without thinking of Joan. Um, there's a couple of other questions here. Alistair Peebles says, has uh, Joan Erdley's photographs, have Joan Erdley's photographs been catalogued and are they held or available in a particular archive? They're in the... Um, National Gallery's archive, the, the NGS archive. Uh, no, I don't think they are. I haven't even, I have looked at them and realised once and realised that there were so many, I couldn't see them all in one day um, to, to um, look at them thoroughly. So I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so there, I, I don't think they'd be, they've, they've been, it's something that probably needs to be done. But now that things can get put online, it's it's so much better. You get more of a chance to be able to see things, but that's that's another It does thing. sound, I was going to say, it sounds like there's a whole avenue. I, I can't remember which of the panellists was talking about, I think about Victoria and Katrina were talking about her. Um, the photography was much more than an aid memoir. You know, she was actually... Uh, that photography was part of her her process so you know I'm, I'm just it would be interesting to kind of see uh, how someone kind of take apart just the photographs themselves. Uh -huh. Most of the photographs as far as I know are mostly oh, more Glasgow the, yeah. than Catiline. Um, I think she just drew Catiline there catching the, the, the you know the, the essence of it um, I don't think there's so many photographs of, of Catiline. It's most, mostly Glasgow. Uh, I think someone a wee while back actually asked about uh, the Italian images, because of course you mentioned that she had a scholarship to Italy and she um, made mm -hmm. some works uh, from there. But I also see that that question has, has been answered, that there's actually quite a large archive at Glasgow School of Art, which... Uh, uh, there, there's some, there's certainly more in the, the, again, the National Galleries and some in Aberdeen, I think. Yes, uh, when, when all the, 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 the drawings were, were given, the, the, there was like some of each, a, a lot of what was more interest to the area, but also a, a mixture of each so that everywhere had, had, had some, some of each. I mean, a lot of the sketches are very tiny. Um, and yes, Joan kept them, and so they were important to her, obviously, and we, some of them have become very scruffy because I, well, I guess they were just in folders in her studio or whatever, um, until, until uh, they ended up, uh, you know, with, at, at, as I say, with my mother. Um. And what are you most looking forward to this year? There's so many events and exhibitions and you know it, things to sort of mark Joan's centenary what are you most looking forward to? I think actually to be able to see at one time okay over a whole year um, but the different uh, paintings and drawings that are in the different collections to be able to sort of see them all out at one time I think is it's is going to be fantastic because otherwise we have like big exhibition in Edinburgh or wherever if there's something but I think to be able to get them out 
across Scotland so that everybody can get to see some quite near them will be really good um, instead of having to make their little pilgrimages to, uh, you know, Edinburgh or wherever. So I, I think it, it, it hopefully will, will broaden her um, appeal and interest to, to, to the, the, the wider public. And, and the more they're out there, the more people seem to, um, you know, find interest in them. So that's, I, I hope, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it and be able to go around and see some, because sometimes when they're in collections and places, they're not always out and you don't get to see them. Yeah, no, it is amazing. It's also amazing that it's happened in this time where everything seems to be so restricted and so, you know, narrowed in, but all of a sudden we, we do have this opportunity to kind of take a much more holistic approach to her, to our her artwork, which is, you know, just just amazing. And I'm I'm glad it's managed to to happen in time for her centenary as well. Yes, it's been difficult. And it's the, the, the Sworn group have done wonderful things. I think that's been very good in actually bringing everybody together. So um, you know, they, they've done a, 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 a great lot there. Well, Anne, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you, to share so many stories about Joan Erdley today. I hope it will broaden her appeal across the world. I recently had a peek in the uh, Dovecot studios at the tapestry that they're working on in their uh, recreation of one of Joan's landscapes. Yes, in... I'm good, going to see it in a couple of days. Fabulous, wasn't it? I just had a peek because it wasn't, you know, they were still working on it. But there's so many, you know, so many wonderful projects going on. And while we were there, we were talking uh, you know, to a number of people there, we came to the conclusion that that passion for Joan's work, that interest is still growing. And one day, hopefully soon, everyone will know who Joan Erdley is, not just the many of us who've gathered today. Meantime, on the 100th anniversary of her birth, thank you all very much for joining us. And if you can, let's raise a glass to Joan. To Joan, happy 100th birthday.